one of the main things is first to kind of promote, advertise, for lack of a better word, what are the problems. We lack entrepreneurs coming into that space in Africa, so we need to tell them what are the problems so they can start cracking down on the solutions. That's the first thing, right? Getting the guys interested and enticed. Second is trying to de-risk the, the, you know, throwing yourself into venturing. And the problem in the global south is that there's far lesser welfare than in the global north. So throwing yourself into entrepreneurship is far more risky than it would be in the global north. You don't have the same support mechanism. So investing into the nursery and providing them a bit of stipend or some kind of funding support to start with is important. And the technical assistance. So supporting them with ME practices, measurement and evaluation for the impact, but also a bit of financial support. Then another factor to entice them is clearly to talk about the success stories. Tell them that some people are making it happen for themselves, right? And for the other people and the community that they live in um, to further motivate them, essentially. And last but not least is connecting those entrepreneurs to a broader network. We all know that your network is your net worth and that really is essential, especially in Africa. It is essential to invest in developing country directly. Africa is probably one of the least contributing continents to climate change, but being now hit the worst, right? And it's gonna get only worse from here. Um, so definitely, and especially because innovation is not just there to change the impact of our system and industries, but it's also to build adaptability. The change is happening. It's not just about mitigation, it's about adaptation, building resilience. And for this to happen, you, you have to invest locally because the resilience needs, needs to be built locally. The, the other factor here is that there's a lot of indigenous knowledge. There's a lot of knowledge that actually sits in coastal communities here in Africa, for example. And we need to leverage this because the way they manage their ocean, they know their ocean. And they've been perpetuating this for generations on without any adverse effect. So we need to leverage this, invest into that knowledge, take it, learn from it, and build solutions around it. For any investors or any people, any decisions to be made actually, you need to have a thorough understanding of what the problem is to build the right solution. The better knowledge when it comes to ocean impact, over-exploitation, pollution, and climate change sits with scientists. So if they can better inform decision-making and solution-making, uh, um, it's, it's definitely an appeal for investors. Unfortunately, we all know that sometimes, with all due respect to, to the science community, very much so, um, in science, it's never black or white. It's always shades of gray, which makes it a bit difficult. So scientists will not be 100% one way or another, uh, which can be a little bit detrimental because given the pace and the scale of the challenges, we need to act now. So one philosophy in the startup space is very much trial and error. Fail fast, learn from it and rebuild and, and improve. So it's a matter of translating and you know, aligning the objectives with science. But the long and the short is if you do get approved, science approved, then obviously it's, it's a big token for investors moving forward. Whether we want it or not, we are going to have change the way we live in the next 10 to 12 years. If we don't do anything now, that change will be dramatic and it will be to adapt or to withstand the wrath of natural disasters and climate change. If we start changing now, incrementally, we can make sure or we can work towards having the amplitude of that change to be lessened in a way and less traumatic because less you know, we'll have more time to adapt to that change and implement it. Let's make it smooth for everyone and start now.